hopefully you're all well. Uh, this is the recording of our session on soccer hacks and how to think about the game differently. And just to start with, as a, as a bit of a warm-up activity, I'd like you to go to www.menti.com and use the code 529732. And I want you to answer this question. I want you to rank in order of what you think is the most important at this stage of your development. And as you can see, as you guys keep answering, um, the, the, the graphs will change. All right. So if everyone can have a go at that, it should only take you a minute. We've had one person answer so far. Two, four. Here we go. Beautiful. Now we've got about 20 on, so I'd like to get close to 20 answers before I move to the next question. And again, there's no right or wrong, and it's completely anonymous. So whatever you think is the most important at the moment, and in that order. So first is the most important thing at the moment, mentals winning, then we've got technical, then we've got tactical, and then we've got physical at this stage. You've got 20 seconds to get your votes in. And the reason we've chosen these four, these are the four, four quadrants or the areas that they identify in youth development and player development as the four key parts of making a player. All right, 19 is a good number. We'll work with that. If you're still answering it, you can answer it. Um, interesting, yeah, interesting. As you can see by the uh, by the votes, mentals in front by a fair bit, and then technical, tactical comes down at third, and then physicals down there at fourth, which is which is interesting. Um, Certainly, I think mental is the most important part for you now. Uh, and I guess the best way to explain it to you in a, in a very short sentence is you can run all day, you can kick the ball as hard as you can, but if you don't know how to do it, when to do it, and where to do it, it's useless to you. And that's where mental comes, the thought process. So that's why this, this uh, thing will educate you today. Okay, one more question you're going to do for me. And it's uh, finished this sentence. So before COVID-19 restrictions, I spent, and then answer this part, on developing my mental skills. And I want you to be as honest as possible. Very interesting. And to be fair, it's it's kind of what I expected, to be honest, which is fine. Mr. Cataforis, what do you think? Hmm, interesting. Uh, sorry, uh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, expect that. What have we got? 25 kids. Quarter. 25 kids, what about 16 out of 22, 25? Yeah, yeah not too bad. About All 80%, right. 85% of them. Yeah, nice. Hopefully by the end of today, you can uh, change that perception. So, how to think about the game differently. First of all, like I said at the start, if you've just joined, get yourself a piece of paper or a notepad because I think you'll uh, you'll take more from it by doing that. Um, and just have that beside you to take some extra notes if you want to. So today, as I put up before the topics I'm going to cover, and this, again, is a very, very broad topic, and we'll need to do it over several presentations, otherwise you'll, you'll die of boredom. Um, one that I threw in there was decision-making, and it, it came after a conversation with Jared, actually, um, about decision-making, and I didn't initially want to put it in there, but then I, I found some really good resources that I've been studying for a while, and I thought I could put it into a quick context for you. And then the other ones are, the, uh, are things that are taken from a book called uh, Soccer IQ, if some of you have read it, and I've tried to give you some examples of yourselves in training through video, or, or I'll talk about those examples. Um, and then I had two student questions that were sent during the week as well. The first one was, how do I learn to hide my weaknesses and play to my strengths? And the second one was, what is more important, the ability to grow mentally or physically, which I guess you've answered a little bit in that one there. So to start with, I want to show you a, a little image. So this image is your brain, and this is the information that you're going to get from me today and probably what you've got all day from your teachers and school and family. You get a lot of information in a day. It's all out there. How much of it 
you take in and put it into this central part where you actually process it and it all fits in together, that requires you to think about it further. So me telling you about this stuff today is just the starting point. I'm not going to give you the answers for life. I don't think that's possible from anybody. They can just guide you to make you think about things differently. And once you start thinking about it differently, you'll come up with your own answers. Okay. So let's start with an image. It's got nothing to do with soccer. It's got everything to do with decision making. So have a look at this clip. There's no sound to it. See what you think. And I'll talk to you about why I'm using an NFL clip. This is our Tom Brady, by the way, who's a, a famous quarterback in NFL, American football. And he's the guy that just threw the ball there. Okay. So I'll show you the clip one more time and I'll give you the relevance to it again. And uh, in the background of Tom Brady, the quarterback in NFL, think of him as the playmaker. So it, when you when we play soccer and you have a midfielder or a defender, DM, someone there that likes to playmake and split the balls and distribute, that's what the, the quarterback does. It's the most important position in on the field in the NFL. Okay. So let's talk about Tom Brady quickly. He was pick 199 in the 2000 NFL draft. So he was chosen as the 199th best young player, which means he wasn't. He was far down the list. And the reason was, according to all the experts, these are some of the comments that came from the from the uh, expert coaches and the scouts. He's got a poor build. He's very skinny and he's very narrow. He lacks great physical stature and strength, and he can get pushed around easily. So basically, I didn't think he was going to make it in the, in the really hustle and bustle of the NFL. Interestingly, though, there was one positive that was listed by many of the scouts and the coaches, but they overlooked this. A lot of them did. And that was his decision making. OK. Now, based on that, what was his record just before he retired recently? Six Super Bowls. You can see him down the bottom with his six Super Bowl rings. He's the record holder for the most Super Bowl wins by one single player. And he's also the oldest quarterback at 41 years of age to win the Super Bowl. So all of those things that were his weaknesses up the top that basically chose people to overlook him in the draft, the main key focus that he had, the key thing that he had above everybody else, which is very hard for people to, I guess, put a figure on, because you can race from A to B and get a number with a stopwatch. You can jump from here to there and measure it, but you can't measure somebody's intelligence and decision making. You can just watch them and see how they solve problems on the field. And in this case, at 41 years of age, he was still solving problems and he was still the best in the league. Uh, they don't have time to make passes, quarterbacks. They have split seconds to make decisions, right? So we talk about decision-making speed, and these are some of the, the attributes of when you make a decision, and this is not based just on sport. This is actually based on business and people making decisions in life. These are some of the common trends that seem to come up. The first one is understanding pattern recognition. So the more you've seen a situation, and the more you've thought about it in the past, the better decision you can make moving forward. And obviously when we apply that to soccer, the more you train in a team environment, the better your skills are, the better your understanding of your teammates and your technical skills, the better decisions you can make and quicker. The next one is you control what you can control. So in, in a game, there's 11 v 11, there's wind, there's elements. We spoke about this in one of the previous presentations. But a person that makes quick decisions, they decide that they can only control certain aspects. So that's what they focus on and they make their decision. They also are known to make really quick decisions, small decisions quickly. So instead of overanalyzing a situation and thinking about that killer through ball to your winger, they just make the short, simple pass and then get it back again and maybe look for that pass again, rather than trying to hold on to the ball for three or four seconds and decide on what's going to happen next. OK, in that time, things get slow and you'll see one of the slides about speed of play later on. They also try and think black and white as quickly as possible. So there's a right, there's a wrong. I'm going to pick the right. I'm going to go with it and we move on. And that also ties in with the last point, which is they're willing to fail because they know that there's going to be failure, but they embrace that as a chance to learn. OK, so this comes back to that growth mindset material that we covered. So this is, a, this is a factual piece of evidence for you. The fastest decision-making time a person can make is 0 0.2 of a second. So if we, all, if we all train ourselves, that's the absolute quickest anyone's been recorded at making a decision. And that could be a reflex task or identifying a color, you know, high-fiving something. But the key is to actually see things before they happen. So I'm going to show you a little example of a player that some of you might know. His name is Philip Coutinho. 
This was when he was playing for Liverpool. And I'm going to play the video a few times and I'll talk over it. You'll see the first part of it is just the finish from Sturridge against Borussia Dortmund. And he'll celebrate for a few seconds. And what you're looking at here is when, when they show the replays, I want you to look at Coutinho who makes the assist. And I want you to think how much time he actually had to make that decision from when he received the ball and how much he made the decision before he received the ball. So it'll come up in a second now. Have a look. He's in the middle of the field. And you'll see it again from a different camera angle, which I think is the best view for it. Now let's go back to that one for a second. That's the first one. Okay. And I'll, I'll hold it for a sec. So he's just received the ball. Has he taken a touch? Has he stopped the ball? No. Is his head still kind of facing forward? Yes. He's facing the way the ball came from, which means prior to this pass, he's already identified that there's space somewhere in behind here and that he's going to play the ball into there. And whether or not his, strike, his striker, uh, Daniel Sturridge, in this case, runs onto it is not the point. The point is that he's seen that there's an opportunity for a through pass and a creative midfielder, that's their job. So if we look back a little bit, and it's, it's a little bit hard to tell um, in this one, he just did a little head check now, just before this ball's about to be played. He's done another little head check there and he no longer needs to do a head check because... He's already seen what he needs to see. So watch it again in real time. And this is what we call seeing things before they happen. So he's seen the gap. That, that pass can only work if he's made his decision before he's received it. Because if he takes a touch, Daniel Sturridge is offside. And the defenders have a chance to react. But because he doesn't take a touch, and he obviously it's a skillful pass as well. Let's not take away the skill factor but he needed to make that decision before the ball came to him, okay? Hopefully that gives you a little bit of an understanding about what we're talking about when it comes to seeing things before they happen and how that's important for decision-making. And I guess that then now leads into what we're going to call these little soccer hacks, little ways that you can see things a little bit quicker than others, and then potentially from that, you can make decisions quicker than others and be a much, a much more effective player and enjoy the game a lot more. So we're going to talk about something that's called the impossible pass. Now I'm going to let this guy explain it. This guy, this author's name is Dan Blank. Uh, he wrote the book Soccer IQ and Soccer IQ 2. Brilliant author, really analyzes the game well and puts things into a very, uh, very easy to understand perspective. He's coached a lot of women's soccer. So whenever he refers to anyone in the diagram, it's usually her or she, which is good because we always hear the male side of things. So let's have a listen and have a watch of this one. All right, let's talk about what I refer to as the impossible pass. Quite simply, what I'm referring to is when a teammate of the player in the ball asks for a ball to be delivered that can't possibly be delivered. So for in this example, let's say the, the white team is attacking this goal down here. Uh, this player has the ball. She's kind of pinned up against the sideline by a defender. And here you are in here and you're all by yourself. And if you got that ball, man, would you have a great chance to score? So what do you do? You start screaming at that player to get you the ball. The problem is she can't get it to you. The ball is on the wrong side of her body. There's a defender or an opponent between her and the ball and you. And she's got a lot of things on her mind right now. So what you're doing by screaming for this ball here is, is you're actually being counterproductive because one, she can't possibly deliver that ball to you. Two, you're being annoying. And three, one of your teammates might actually be trying to give her some information that might be useful. When we talk on the field, we got to talk about what's best for the ball and what's best for the team. So in this example, let's just say that this is Jenny on the ball and this is Danielle back here. You know, maybe we can say we, we recognize the situation. We recognize that Jenny's in a lot of trouble. Maybe if we tell her, hey, play Danielle. Now she knocks the ball back to Danielle. Now maybe Danielle can get you that ball and we've done something useful. So don't just yell to yell. Don't just yell somebody's name. Give them some information that's actually going to help them solve their problems. Another time we see the impossible pass quite a bit is when a player has a ball here. And again, the white team is attacking this direction. Player receives the ball here. And this player runs behind her and is screaming for the ball. 
Again, the ball is on one side of this player's body, her support is on the other side, and there's a defender in between them. And here's the thing, this, a lot of players will try to play this pass, and the problem is it is so predictable for this defender because she saw this attacker coming, and what she does is she just simply slides into here, we try to play that pass, and this defender picks it off. And this is another example of a typical impossible pass. So here's, here's an example here's of a an target forward trying game. to connect an impossible pass to a teammate who has run beyond her. As the attacker shapes her body, the pass becomes very predictable. It's an easy pass for the defender to read and intercept. Here's another look at a target player trying to stuff an impossible pass in behind the defense. Again, it's an easy read for the defender, and the pass is blocked. So you might look at that and say, oh, I never do that, but I can guarantee you from our experiences of watching you guys play, that's one of the most common mistakes, and that's why I started with it. It is one of the most common mistakes that we see in junior sport, okay? And it's a lot has got to do with that rule that we tried to enforce years ago with you guys that have been with us for a while, which is, if you receive the ball with your back to goal, you must play it first time to somebody. That's just to get you thinking, not th to basically not think about that impossible pass. But we tried to put it in a different way for you to understand that. So hopefully you understand that one. Now we're going to see um, some of our kids in a training session, which we uh, filmed to create a curriculum video. And we're going to see an example of the impossible pass by uh, one of our players. So have a look at this. It it'll go back into a slow motion version. So it's Michael Vonya here. Okay. And he basically does exactly what happened there. He's received the ball on his, on his front foot. And instead of just playing the ball back to Hibber, and I'll pause and stop it, at this moment where he could have just maybe played the ball there and she can go for that pass or she can play him through again, he's tried to play this pass across here. And the defending, I think it's from Philip there, is quite, quite simple. He just sticks his leg out, as you can see him there. Sticks his leg out. There's the interception. Okay. And that is an impossible pass. Now, you might ask the question, and we're not, we're not talking about the run of the player because at the end of the day, you've got the ball, so you're making the decision. Could the run have been better level and outside instead of in front of the ball? Yes. But having said that, even if he was here, this defender's doing a good job. So the right pass in this situation would be first time back to Hibba there or hold it up for a second and then lay it off to it. Okay? So don't get upset, Mikey. You'll get a good advantage. Uh, there'll be a shot of you later on doing, doing a good thing. So watch it one more time, just so you can remember it a bit better. So there's the receive. And instead of playing the ball backwards, he tried to go for that impossible pass. He even had that option there. But, okay. There we go. So hopefully you can understand that one. How do you avoid it is the most important part. And we've said this to you a few times over the last couple of years. I think stay level and outside or behind the ball if you can't get level and outside. So this is if you're the receiver. And if you are one of the receivers, don't call out their name. There's no point in me calling out your name because you know your name. So if I yell out, George, 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 what does that, how, how does that help George in that situation? Maybe if I give him an instruction like lay it off to Hibba or play it first time, hold it up, front post if you're running in for a cross, okay? Instead of giving a name, give an instruction. I'm pretty sure all of your teammates recognize your voice and it won't be an opponent player calling for the ball, telling you what to do with it. Okay, so that's one way you can avoid this situation happening, or two ways, sorry. All right. Let's see some people avoiding this situation by actually doing it. So here's some positive examples of it. And I love how it's two goalkeepers that just combine there. And obviously Mikey finishes with a beautiful nutmeg finish there. So I told you I'll give you some um, something positive, Mikey. But as you can see in these movements, just have a look at when they play the ball, where they play the ball, and where their movement is to support the ball. Okay? So this is a little soccer hack for you. Just keep moving away from your opponent. You'll notice at times those uh, blue defenders get caught watching the ball because they have to. They're the moments that they moved. And here's an example of the blue team doing something similar quite, quite well, actually. You'll see some double combinations with Philip and Dion in that attacking third here. And finishes with a lovely goal. 
So watch it again. Starts from here in the back. Moving in between little pockets of space. Nearly got cut out there. A little bit of skill in that situation. And here we start to see the movement. So Dion's making a few different runs. Phil's going to make a fake run, then come back to the ball. Beautiful movement there. He's going to hold it up, fake one way, and play the ball the other way. And then the impossible pass becomes a beautiful goal. You can do it, guys. Okay. Now, let's talk about speed of play. And I've said this to our kids in the past in some teams, but maybe we, we haven't had the chance to explain it this well. To play fast, you need to want to play fast. And I agree with anybody that's uh, on this chat that you can't play fast all the time. You decide in the game when you're going to accelerate and when you're going to slow the game down. But when you do decide to play fast, everybody has to play fast. It makes the move work. And I'll show you some examples later on. Okay, so... Let's go through the ladder of speed. The slowest thing on the field is a player dribbling with the ball going side to side. Okay, that is the slowest way you can move the ball. I'm not saying you don't need to do it from time to time because, yes, if you've got a 1v1 to beat somebody, you need to do that. Then you go past them. Um, but it is the slowest way to actually move the ball. And you can time yourself if you don't believe me. The second one is a player running with the ball straight ahead at top speed. That's the next slowest thing. So if you've got a ball, you've got an open goal, and you're running with the ball at top speed, like tapping it in front of you and chasing it, then there's a person running without the ball. So if I'm running onto a ball that someone's played to me, that moment from when I start running to when I receive the ball is the, is the fastest I can move until this point, the ball itself. So nothing on the field moves as fast as the ball. Absolutely nothing. You can race any player in the world at top speed, where you get the player side by side with the ball, I kick the ball, you run next to the ball, the ball is going to beat you every single time if I hit it right. Okay? So if, if that's the case, it's how we pass the ball to each other that is very important. So our ball speed. Okay? So let's have a look at some footage from our, our year 10s, now year 11s last year, about playing the ball or the ball speed being quick and how effective it can be when it is. And here's, this is the example of someone holding on to the ball. Not this one, sorry, that was the goal. There'll be an example of the other version of it. So if you have a look, go back to that, the start of that video. Most of these movements are done within a couple of touches. And you'll notice the ball speed creates the opportunity. That started from a defensive action here, and it ends up with a, a chance on goal. And there's some great movement, but we're more focused on how quick the ball's played. Simple, effective. And in the end, it has a blocked shot, and then the rebound comes back out. Okay? So, I'm going to give you an example now of a not-so-good one. Unfortunately for Mo Tafaha, he's going to come up in this video. But this was taken uh, early in this year with our Year Nines training, and we were working on forward runs in this particular video. How many times have you or a teammate done this? So let's go back to that. And I'll stop it in a moment. At that point, he can play it to Shanae. At that point, he can play it to Shanae. At that point, he can play it to Shanae. But he gives it to Shanae when Mike has already closed her down. And this is that crippling effect. You guys can come on to the ball way too long and just let the ball move. She's got no chance of scoring then because she's now got the long legs of Michael to contend with. And that chance is gone. Had that ball been played a bit earlier when he engaged Ethan, okay, this defender here, if he'd engaged Ethan earlier, then that's just a simple goal. And you can probably answer this question in your head how many times you've done this to a teammate. If I go through our videos, I could find thousands of examples of this. Okay? So instead of playing a quick and simple pass that will make the game faster and make the action happen faster, we actually do our simple pass as the last resort. And in that situation, Mo did it. It was his last resort. So he started to get closed down. All these other options. Ethan did some great defending there to stop the shot going into the goal. And instead of just giving the ball simple, he decided to complicate life. Okay? So that's that one. Play from a spot. 
Now, this is one where I'd love you after this video, and again, this is where you take some notes, to go and find a, a match, a Premier League, an A-League, whatever league you want to watch, Matilda's match, find it online and go and watch it and tell me how many times you see someone playing from the spot. Playing from the spot just means this. You kill the ball close to you, so you actually stop it dead with your first touch, or you play it first time, and you pass it or shoot without actually taking any extra touches or moving with the ball. And there's a reason for this. So let's say a player receives the ball facing his or her goal, okay, and your closest opponent is 10 metres away. So I'm receiving the ball, my next opponent's 10 metres away. Now, what happens in that? Let's have a look at this video. This is a really good way for me to explain it to you. This is the girls training earlier this year as well. And there's some good little build up there. Joker plays it in. And at that moment, yes, it's a bad touch, but it's a bad touch because she wants to move the ball forward. If she kills the ball dead, she has what's called a buffer between her and the defender. Because the defender, if you kill the ball dead, this is what happens. If you don't kill it dead, you've got the ball and the defender's running, time is going to meet very close together, right? But if you control the ball and stop it dead and the defender's still here, they still need to run to you to close your space. And in this video, you can clearly see that there's a, a really good opportunity to play a through ball to a wide player. All she has to do is kill the ball, like stop it, and then play it first time, and that defender's out of the game. But she takes a touch. And that gives the defender half a chance to win the ball back. Okay, we're going to see another example in this one. Okay, so midfielder's got it. Can play it early, can play it early. Holds on to it, takes the touch. I'll make that one a bit bigger so you can see it. Actually, you don't need it bigger. You can see it from there. Okay, so here at this moment, can she play early? Maybe a one-two, maybe a pass out to there. Maybe a switch in the gap there. That's a referee there. Maybe a through ball to the winger. No, she's going to take it. This is Aaliyah. So sorry, Aaliyah, if you're watching. Takes a few extra touches. And in that time, her space gets closed down. And I think they end up scoring from this anyway as a transition moment. Had she played from the same spot, and I'll, the last video I'll show you will have some examples of that, of people playing very simple, sharp passes without moving, you actually give yourself more time. And in the Premier League, it doesn't actually doesn't matter. I've tried this in every league I've watched. You'll see defenders do it a lot in the back line into midfield, where they actually, once they they run when they don't have the ball, but as soon as they receive the ball, they kill it dead, and then they play from that spot. It just gives them an extra couple of metres and an extra second or two to make a better decision. That way, if they're being pressed, they're not actually bringing the ball to the press and making it easy for him or her to steal it off her. Okay? So we call it a cushion. You want to keep a cushion between you and your defender. Okay, does that one make sense? Yes, that's the video. I'll show you that one now so I can break it up a little bit. And you can see some examples of very fast play from a spot where they don't move much. Now, some of these skills are outrageous. I want you to focus on how many times a player doesn't move after they've received the ball. So they move to get into a position but then they stop. This is a really good example of shooting from a spot. Not dribbling the ball into somebody, then trying to shoot. Okay, it's some lovely combinations. So all this movement's happening off the ball, like you saw with um, the video before of our, of our kids training with the drone footage. There were some really good passages very similar to this. Okay, this is at the elite level. And there are, there are some little outrageous things which you guys are focused on, but just please focus on how little they run with the ball for no reason. They only run at somebody when there's a proper 1v1. And even then, they'll still try and pass through them because it's just more effective. So watch, player receives it, stops, ball plays first time from that spot or within one metre of that step. And then there's your touch and finish because you're close to goal. I'll show you one more example and then we'll move to the next slide. I'll show you the actually the right right at the start there was an Arsenal one which is quite good. This is an example of playing a through ball first time without moving. Takes if he takes a touch there that through ball doesn't happen, but he doesn't. He just first time 
Yes, you have to have the skill to do it, but you also have to have the understanding to try it. This is the Arsenal one, which some of you will know from the past. Okay? Not a lot of dribbling, not a lot of running with the ball until it's a 1v1. Then they take their time and their touch. They call it um, the goals that you can only see on FIFA because when you play FIFA, this is what some of those combinations look like. And you think it's unrealistic, but this is real soccer being, being exactly like that. Okay? Ah, my favorite, the unforgivable offside. Now, if you have a look at that image, that image should explain everything. There's a back four. You're on the outside of the back four. You can be on either wing and you can see the whole back line. Yet you get caught ball watching and the back line steps up a bit. You put your hand up to call for the ball and, and the midfielder plays you the through ball and you're caught offside. We call this unforgivable. The reason it's unfor unforgivable is because you can see the whole line from here. If you were the central striker and you had to look both ways, we maybe forgive it a little bit because let's be real, it's hard to check both ways, see where you are and see where the ball is. But if you're just here, your headspace is looking across the line. Uh huh. I need to move backwards with them. I need to move forwards with them. That's all I need to do. Okay? And it's, it's a really frustrating one because these kind of through balls are the ones that can win you games. And these kind of offsides are the ones that really cost you games because they sh you should actually just stay on side and time your run and run onto it, especially considering the players that usually play in those wide positions are blessed with speed, okay? So there is no excuse for you being offside in that position. So whenever you're in that situation where you've overlapped as a fullback or as a midfielder you're coming through, or if you're a winger, next time you're at training or in games, make sure you're looking across that line to, to ensure that you're not offside. You shouldn't be offside in that situation. Okay. Now, my personal, apart from that one, this is my pet hate as a defensive player and when we're trying to clear the ball. So I'll let him explain it again because, again, he does a really good job and he wrote the book on this one. So let's watch it. One sec. What we're going to talk about right now is clearing the opponent's first wave of pressure. Let's say in this example that you are the left back and the closest player to pressure you is going to be a right-sided player from the SALT team. Now, whether or not you're hitting a clearance or you're trying to get the ball to your left winger up here, one of the commandments of defending is that we cannot lose the ball to that first wave of pressure. We must, absolutely must, get the ball beyond that first wave. This is why this is so important. As We've gotten possession of the ball and we start to take our attacking shape and some players, we start to get spread out and our teammates start to move up the field. We're not in a position to defend. Our team shape is set up to attack. Now, when you go to play this ball, if it doesn't make it past this player, then all of a sudden they're in a great position to counterattack. They don't have a lot of field left to conquer. We're not in a position to defend. So these always tend to lead to, to very dangerous counterattacks for our opponent. So when you're playing this ball, you want to make sure if you're going to play it wide of her, you leave yourself a little extra margin for error to make sure that she can't stick a foot out and knock it down. If you're going to play over the top of her, then make sure it gets over the top of her. Again, leave yourself an extra yard or two as a margin for error. We've got to make absolutely certain that this ball gets beyond that first wave of pressure. Now, what tends to happen here is if we fail at getting the ball beyond this first wave, this, let's say this player gets close enough, a lot of times we kick the ball, we're, we're trying to play long, this player deflects the pass, and then the next thing you know, that ball ends up deflecting that way. At this moment, most of the time, this player is gonna be the player who wins the race to that ball, which is obviously bad. The very best you can hope for is that you're the first person to that ball, that you win that race, but even now you've put yourself in a very difficult position. You're heading back towards your own goal and you've got pressure on you, all because your initial pass didn't make it past the opponent's first wave of pressure. This is why this is one of the commandments of defending. In this clip, the player in black twice fails to clear the opponent's first wave of pressure. The result is a quick counterattack for the orange team that nearly results in a goal. Let's take another look and see how quickly things can unravel 
when you fail to clear that first wave. First, the right back doesn't leave herself enough margin for error on her initial pass, and then tries to dribble herself out of trouble. When the ball is lost, she's caught out of position, and the orange team is off to the races. This time it's the center back who doesn't clear the first wave, and again it leads to a dangerous counterattack. Risk management is critical in your defensive third. Look at how little field the orange team has left to conquer when possession changes. This defender's failure to clear the opponent's first wave nearly cost her team a goal. In this clip, the player in white doesn't leave herself enough margin for error, and her attempted clearance is blocked harmless situation nearly turns into a very dangerous one. Considering the position of the pressuring attacker, the player in white may just have to cut her losses and angle this clearance out of bounds. In this next clip, the defender in white makes certain that her clearance can't be blocked by the pressuring attacker. Because the risk is so high, she wisely chooses to sacrifice distance for safety. Blocked clearances often turn into game-changing moments, so you've got to avoid them at all costs. And I guess you can talk to um, you can talk to us about that in terms of how many goals you've conceded at your club level and definitely at school level, where it's come from our own clearance and it just hasn't gone far enough, or we've kicked it into a player, or we've hit a short pass and it's been intercepted. And the, and he says it really well earlier on in that piece: is you're not in a position to defend because if once you've won the ball back you go into what we call BP, which is ball possession, you start to open up because you want to spread the game out. So it's very crucial that that first pass is actually secure. So it's either goes back to your keeper and you reset, or if it has to be a clearance, like you saw with the example of the girl towards the end, angled, high, slow, slow, high clearances, take, it takes time for the ball to land. And while the ball's landing, you can still work out whether your teammate's going to win it or whether they're going to lose it. But either way, because you've cleared it so far and wide, it's no longer in that dangerous area, that first wave of pressure, okay? And that's that's one, if, you, if, you, if you're really looking at quick results, like instant results, in, and I know that's hard to do in soccer, but if, if that's one thing you take from this, whenever you're in a defensive position that you actually clear lines, yeah, okay, you might kick it out from time to time. I think sometimes we've become a little bit preoccupied with playing out of the back because it's in the curriculum and we play out of the back. But again... When you're under pressure and you watch the top teams play in the Premier League or um, in the A-League, if they're under pressure, the ball goes. And once the ball goes, the whole team goes out with it. And then you say, okay, I'd rather lose the ball 50 metres from my goal than 10 metres from my goal. It's less dangerous. It's called risk management. Okay? So that's that one. So on that note, that's the end of the, um, the presentation part for that. Now I had the two questions the first one was, how do I learn to hide my weaknesses and play to my strengths? So what I, what I came to uh, in terms of a conclusion to this question was, I don't know if you actually want to be hiding your weaknesses as a junior player. I definitely will do it as a senior player because you're playing for points and money and whatever it is, contracts, that sort of stuff. But when you're a junior player, it depends on how you use the word weakness. Now, if you, if you decide that your left foot is a weakness at the moment, and you decide that because it's a weakness, you're not going to try and work on it, then it's always going to be a weakness. And the higher level you go to, the harder it will be for you to hide that weakness, as this question asks. So I guess I looked at the question from a different perspective because I understand how it was coming across from, from the boy that sent it to me. Um, you can change the way you think about it, and that might change the way you deal with it in a game. So, for example, instead of using the word weakness, Maybe I, I change that thought in the things that I can do better. So in every game, instead of saying this is my weakness, this is something I can do better. Now, automatically by saying that, just in your head, it feels better. It doesn't feel like it's a, a massive burden. But if you say you're rubbish at something, you're, you're crap, you're not very good, well, you're going to start to believe that and you're not going to want to improve it. It's going to be hard to improve it because it'll be a, a stigma that you attach to your brain. The second one is the strength. So... When you, when you talk about a strength, you know what things you do well. Hopefully, your coaches tell you. We definitely tell you. We encourage you to do them well. Do the things that you do well in the right areas, and you should win games if everybody does that. However, you're not senior players yet. 
So you're still in a phase where you're still trying to learn as much about the game as possible. And the only way to learn is to make mistakes, think about it, do it better next time. So that goes back to that growth mindset stuff. I guess in, in a very short way, try not to same, make the same mistake twice, which, which is a weakness because that means you're not thinking about what you're doing wrong. But be prepared to make mistakes and show, out your, show your weakness and then work on your weakness and eventually your weakness becomes something that you do well, okay? And change the way you think about it, things that you can do better. But it was a great question to have. And this was the second important, the ability to grow mentally or physically. Well, obviously the answer came from, from your survey early on in this uh, presentation, but I found this um, really interesting pyramid and I thought, in terms of your foundation and your base to become successful as a footballer, you need to have that mental foundation. So as it says down the bottom there, there's got to be the power in your head to choose goals. And setting these goals is what makes you stronger because then you are focused on them. And if you're focused on them, you go and train harder and you become physically better. And if you're getting physically better, your skills then start to become better. And from your skills, you start to understand tactics. Okay, same as the one, the people that have joined this meeting today, you've all joined this meeting because you want to learn something new about the game and make yourself better. So you're already, you've already set yourself a nice little micro goal, a small goal, which was, I'm going to watch his presentation today and I'm going to take something from it. Your midterm goal might be, I'm going to start to apply this stuff so that I can get to my dream goal and play at a high level. Okay, and then once you've, once this stuff's already in your head, it's the same as those people that are doing these push-ups every day and the sit-ups and the plank and the, the lunges, you're already mentally preparing yourself to set goals and achieve goals. The physical stuff's happening because that's your goal. But as you do that, you're going to become more skillful because, hey, my torso's stronger. I can shove people around a bit because I've got bigger arms. Okay, my quads are bigger and stronger. I can kick the ball harder because I'm doing these simple lunges before I, before I leave my room in the morning. Then you start to build your confidence because you have skill and, and you know a player that's really good at something, they play the game on instinct and and the, the top players like your Messi's, your Sam Kerr's, your um, Abby Wombach's, these players just play the game to the best of their ability because they've played it so much and they've practiced it so much and they've set themselves targets for so long. Okay, Then you start to peak and at the end of it, you have a 100% ready athlete. But as a, as a little positive, I managed to um, speak to uh, a Western United player, Stephen Lushtitzer, who's... Being a professional football yep. player, I found that the mental side of football is probably a little bit more important than the physical side. The physical side, it's something that you can always train. You can always train to be fit. You can always work on that area. Um, but the mental side is something that is a lot harder. Um, I found this, an example of this is when I was in Croatia playing. Uh, there was a time where the coach wasn't playing me. I wasn't even on the bench at that time. Um, he wasn't speaking to me and I was pretty much left out in the cold. And that was a really challenging time for me, even though physically I was ready to play. Mentally, I had to make sure that I was really switched on and ready to go for to get that chance. Um, football is about being resilient and in those tough times, you really have to dig deep and make sure that you are mentally prepared because I, I really feel the mental side of the game is, is really important in football and gives you that edge um, to make it to the top level. Okay, so that's a that's an interesting answer. And again, he's using his example of um, of actual resilience in a situation where he's got no control over it. So he can't control if the coach isn't going to play him. All he can control is how he was training. And I remember chatting with him on Facebook during this time, and he um, he brought it up. He goes, "Look, I'm doing everything I can. I'm uh, at the moment. I if, I if I don't keep myself fit and training like a crazy person, and when we do have some, you know, I do get some game time." Well, I'm not going to get picked up by anybody. Now, he did that. He played in two friendly matches in the winter break. And uh, then he got a contract to another club in Uzbekistan. So he, he could have taken it another way and sulked. Like he said, some of his teammates that live in Croatia that actually Croatian, he's an Australian boy, um, they sulked and they just whinged and complained and didn't actually put in any extra work. He just decided, well, I'm here. Uh, if I'm not going to play, I might as well be ready. What if we get three injuries tomorrow and he actually has to play me? So he decided mentally he would set himself up. He found a personal coach and he went and trained extra with the personal coach on the side as well as his club training because he knew he wasn't getting match fitness. So he thought he had to do a bit extra. So that's a really good example of, of a player using their, their mental resilience to set themselves goals and say, well, if I'm not going to play here, 
I'm going to get out of here, but I'm going to make sure I have a, an opportunity elsewhere. But a really good question that came through. OK, so to finish off, I'll go to my uh, thing. They say, oh, why do athletes with average talent succeed? And these are the five reasons that seem to come across every single athlete when you read articles about, you know, their pathway, their passage, like Virgil van Dijk not being wanted by his club at under 14s, saying he's never going to make it to the first team, so we don't need him anymore because he wasn't the most talented. Or he wasn't even the top five talented. That was an article I read the other day. Um, work one, you got to work hard. And you've just seen that with a, with a pro footballer talking to you. Even when, when the time is difficult, even now when you're at home by yourself, you have to work hard. You have to be coachable. So all of you that are online now, you're coachable players because you've made the effort to listen to somebody give you some advice on how to, to learn about the game a little bit differently. So you're coachable. You're willing to take information on board. You're willing to take feedback, positive and negative. Okay, Practicing hard is a given. You need to practice hard. That comes in with work hard. And practice with thought as well. So when you're outside training, it's not just I'm outside because I want my dad to be happy with me that I'm outside kicking the ball. I'm actually going to get something out of this. I'm going to put a different kind of spin on my passes. I'm going to see how the ball starts to change direction when I'm passing it. Maybe I can add some curve with the outside of my foot. Then you're thinking. Do the little things well. Get up in the morning, do that little push-up, sit-up, plank, uh, lunges set every day. It's only a little thing. It only takes five minutes. But if you do that well every single day, imagine what else you can do later on. And the other one there is an interesting one. It's valuing your role. So valuing how you fit into a team of 11. In, 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 it doesn't matter which position that is. It doesn't matter if you're a bench player, but when you come on, you do a job. You have to value your role so that you can find satisfaction in what you're doing. Okay. And wh whether you want to change that role or not in the future will work, will basically be how hard you work in these four categories. So if your role at the moment is your captain, you're the number 10, you're the key playmaker, in order to stay there, you got to keep doing these things. If you're the second string number 10 that sits on the bench, then you need to do the extra things to get yourself in the eye of the coach or another coach at another club where they give you the opportunity and you take it from there. And on the flip side, those talented athletes, those kids that have all this potential and ability and they start off when you first see them, you know, in under 12s, 13s, 14s, one of the best players in the team and all of a sudden not much happens afterwards. Well, they probably didn't work that hard. They didn't take advice from coaches. They took it as something personal when someone told them you should try and do this instead of actually thinking this person's trying to help them. Maybe they didn't listen to the right people and they had the wrong people around them telling them you're going to be a superstar. You don't have to work that hard. You're just you're naturally good. Remember that uh, growth mindset stuff. Maybe they're a little bit selfish. It was all about me. It wasn't about my teammates. I hold on to the ball too much. I keep doing my own thing and then I lose my opportunities because I'm not a team player and it's a team sport. And the last one, again, ties into uncoachable. If you can't accept criticism in life, you can't get better. So how quick is your brain? I want you I want to test you out. Now, this this ties into our Tom Brady stuff. And the, the reason I put this up here is your brain is uh, is constantly evolving and changing and your expertise in soccer is going to get deeper and more connected with your foot skills the more you think about it and do it. So here's, this has got nothing to do with soccer. This is just a little test. So first person to yell it out gets a point. The, fir the first three words, carpet, alert and ink, there's one word that you put into those three words and it gives you it gives you three different meanings to those words. But it's only one word that fits them perfectly. So I'll give you the first one because I don't think you understand the process. But the, the word is red. So red carpet, red alert, and red ink. So have a go at the next one. So master, toss, finger. Go. I'll give you 10 seconds. Ring. Ring. Excellent. Who was that? Marco. Well done. Good stuff. Special prize for you when we get back. So it was ring master, ring toss, and ring finger. Okay, last one there. Have a go. Yeah, I thought that too, but it wasn't. One word that makes all those words different.
the state? Play. 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 Good. Foul play. Playground. Playmate. I said. <laughs> okay. So the, the purpose of that is just for you to understand that you might be quick at, you might be good at this, you might be good at maths, you might be good at science, you might be good at English, and that's how your brain works. Fantastic. Okay. In order to become really, really good and competent at soccer, your brain has to work overtime uh, and learn this, these little tricks and these little secrets to make make your life a little bit easier. And you can learn them in many different ways. This is just one way to learn them where somebody shows you some examples, some videos, they talk to you about it and you think about it. The best way for you to learn it is to actually go and do it. So I understand you can't do that now in your teams, but you can definitely take some notes on this, watch it again, and maybe start a little diary of things that you're gonna try when you're back in your clubs or at school in game situations. And I'll, I'll have a pot shot, I reckon maybe 15%, maybe 10% of you will do that. And they'll be the ones that when, when they come back, you'll start to notice a big difference in them. And those that don't do it, most of you won't do it, sadly. I'd love to say that you all will, but the reality is you won't. You're the ones that will start to either look at that person with a bit of envy and jealousy, or you might use them as an inspiration and say, what did you do? And you go and ask them and you get some advice and say, oh, I actually listened to that and I tried it. Okay. So on that note, we will do another one of these next week with some more hacks. I've got heaps more hacks, including some uh, tricks on throw-ins, corners, um, and then some other individual things you can do on the field, like how to close people down and, and trick them into things. And I'll give you those hacks next week, all right? And I just want you to look at that this image for a second. This is called your social brain. Have a look at Michael Owen on the floor as a famous English footballer now retired and all of his Liverpool teammates and, and most of the people in the crowd. They've all got their hands on their heads. And uh, this is because we have an automatic and an instinctive social emotional response to things so when you see someone uh, bump their head you automatically make this face Ooh. or you see something on tv if you ever watch goggle box and you see people's reactions to certain things they all make similar expressions and and that's because humans are like that we like to we're, we're good at reading other people's behavior and we're also good at seeing what one person does and following them so if, in, in to flip it around and make it positive for you guys if you see a few people um doing this extra work, training, and you start to bring bring yourselves together into small groups and, and actually communicate, hey, I'm trying this, you know, impossible pass stuff or playing from a spot stuff. What are you trying? Then all of a sudden you start to share this, this um, connectiveness and you drive each other and you motivate each other. That's why the power of a crowd or a team is so, so crucial and important, okay?